TED Talks are about sharing ideas. Um, so nothing better than that for that than to make this in English. I remember when I was a child, I used to read books by this uh, Dr. Isaac Asimov. And by show of hands, just so I know, how many of you have ever read a book by this man over here? There you go. I see my dad over there with two hands up. Um, he's an amazing science fiction writer, and I remember that he used to create, he created this concept on some of his books called Foundation, the series of books, and the concept was called Psychohistory. That was a method, a sort of mathematical approach to try and predict how society is going to behave based on past behaviors. So extrapolate, like our previous um, Alvaro said, extrapolate behaviors in order to understand how people are going to keep moving forward. And I remember that the first time I thought of that, it seemed absurd. I read it, and it just felt like it was completely impossible. I mean, how could you ever obtain the necessary data to create these curves, right? How could you make these models that would model something so complex as human behavior? It seemed absurd. And the more I thought of it recently, the more I realized that maybe what Asimov was creating at that point was a very advanced, very incredible version of what we now call machine learning. And this is a field that we're just really starting to explore. This is actually what I want to talk about today. Specifically, I want to talk about how information has evolved over the years and how machine learning now takes part of that evolution. And for that, I want to try to make a very uh, ambitious chart. I want to try to put on the screen all of the information that ever existed in the universe from its creation. You think we can do that? So on a horizontal axis, we're going to look at time. And right in the middle of it is this very instant, is right now. Time equals zero means right this moment. And on the vertical axis would be information. But what is information? Well, there's many definitions, but here I wanted to think about this in Information means every variable of the universe and the state associated with it. So having total information would mean we know everything about everything. Would mean everything and every matter atom in the universe would have its state defined. And that would mean its velocity, its speed, the frequency of the wavelength, things of the sort. And now let's try to look at this from a physics perspective. It will look something like that. So from the beginning of the Earth, and don't worry about the time scale on the horizontal axis, but just think about this. From the beginning of the universe, let's say the Big Bang, up until this very moment, everything that ever existed was completely defined. So things have their states defined, right? Uh, 20 million years ago, if you think about where the positions of all of the galaxies were, it's very well defined. But as you come closer to this very moment, we get very, very near to something called uncertainty. Because the things that are about to happen, the right side of the graph, the future, is totally undefined. There is just no certainty about that. And the position right in the middle, that vertical line where things transition from being uncertain to certain, is something in quantum physics called the collapse of the quantum wave. We can borrow this concept to understand how information moves over time. But actually, what I wanted to look at is a different approach. Let's try to look at the same graph from a human-centric perspective, from how we as people perceive information around us, and then the graph changes. Then you can see that very far in the past, we know very little about what happened because of research and things like that. We know a little bit about how the universe began, and specifically when we started to exist, well, then we have more records about that. Even more importantly, when written language began existing somewhere around that time, then we start to have more and more records. We remember better. It's really a matter of memory here, how much information we stored about the past. And as we move closer and closer to the present, we have more precise information. We remember things more accurately. For instance, I could tell you that the fall of the Roman Empire happened somewhere around September 476 AD give or take one month. 
And some things in particular we know very, very well. I mean, we just completely never forget about those things. And I might tell you, for instance, does anybody know what it is that happened on the 8th of July of 2014? And I want to tell you this. This is something that I'm sure that every single one of this, every single person in this room has a very good memory of. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. That's the day that Brazil played against Germany. And it was very traumatic. Uh, hashtag never forget. But either way, regardless of things that we want to forget or things that we're trying to perceive, actually the most interesting part of this graph comes to the right. It's that little curve on the right side, which means we have a little bit of intuition about what is going to happen in the future. But you might ask, how is it, how's that possible? I mean, how can we, as people, know a little bit about the future? Well, it's actually very easy. You, for instance, might know that probably the sun is going to shine tomorrow. It's going to rise again. And that means it's actually going around the earth. And you know that because you've seen the sun do that so many times in the past. You're extrapolating. You're using your own brain to get these patterns and sort of push them forward. But if I ask you, for instance, what is the exact orbit of the sun tomorrow? How far is it from the Earth in kilometers? Well, probably you can't say, you can't tell. And for that, we need laws, and specifically the Newton's law of gravity. Using that, we can compute exactly the position of the sun tomorrow with very high precision. And actually, what you see is that this law was able to push the curve upwards. We came from this to that because of Newton's law. We actually are able to predict things in the future with a little more precision, a little more information. And in general, if you think about what has happened to several laws of mechanics, physics, and all of the great um, scientists of the past, they have been working a lot to push this graph in that direction. A lot of the laws are doing just that. They're pushing the graph upwards and rightwards. We're seeing more into the future, and we're able to get more information out of it. There's actually one region here, which is what we talked about in the beginning, a sort of imaginative position, something like Asimov might have thought. There would be a position there where we can predict everything that's going to happen in the future. Psychohistory would be somewhere around here. And we call that science fiction, that region of the graph. The part before, we're going to call fundamental, the regions of the fundamental laws, where they apply. And the first little part there we talked about is just intuition, human intuition. Well, there is a part right in the middle that we haven't been able to reach just yet, but we're just starting to. And that part is one reachable by machine learning. Right there is where you see the huge potential that this new technology gives us, and it is right somewhere around there where the possibility, for instance, to one day predict when someone might have cancer, it lies right there. In 2004, my mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I was very young at the time. And at that point, the prediction for her was very little. Was she was going to be with us for a year. She fought bravely and eventually stayed with us for, for over six years after that and passed away in 2010. And, and nowadays I think about why is it at that point that we could not have predicted that? Why couldn't we have known that you would have such a disease and go after curing it before? And the reason for that, actually, is there was no, no data. There was just no information available to create these models. We couldn't. We couldn't find enough records of healthcare. We couldn't just put those things in a computer and it spits out an algorithm. There wasn't enough. And the biggest motor of change in that area, by far, is the internet, the mobile phones and social media. Because this has pushed us into new boundaries where now we're constantly being observed, monitored, or you're constantly having your phone track your position, your watch track your heartbeat, and things like that. All this information has made it possible for these very old algorithms that were created in the 1950s and 60s, the things that now people call machine learning, to be very powerful, 
just because of the sheer amount of data that exists. But as always, there is a good and a bad side to that. You know, all these things that are now being tracked, DNA and the tickets you buy on the weekend or your position in Google Maps or even every login you make in social media, these things are always with you. And there are good and bad things about that. Well, we obviously know the good, we talked about it. It's benefits to our, our healthcare, it's benefits to our quality of life, but often media talks about the, the other side. I mean, the, the, the sheer notion that we're losing privacy, right? We're seeing these huge tech companies make use of this technology for money to observe us all day and be able to just generate better ads for us so that we're gonna buy something. And then there are things that are right in the middle. For instance, the, how the government is starting to use monitoring technology to predict terrorist attacks. Well, that's right in the gray area, right? But what I wanna ask to each and every one of you today is, can we find a balance to this? Is there a way in which we can extract the benefits from having more and more data out there and at the same time not suffer these bad consequences that come with it? I was part of the creation, I was a co-founder of a company that tried to do just that. We were attempting to sort of integrate medical data in a way that would allow these models to be created for hundreds of thousands of people. And throughout that project, we found out one very important truth. And that is, we cannot understand how everybody works if we don't understand each and every one of us. And machine learning is where this potential is really explored to the most. Each and every one of you has the chance to become a data point for the good. I mean, you can be the necessary data point that goes into an algorithm that will one day predict cancer and will allow for somebody else's um, relatives to be saved. And I hope that one day we can definitely get there as a society so that we can predict this for more and more people and other mothers and fathers around there are able to go beyond. Thank you very much.